Ah, there we go. This meeting is being live streamed. We've got it. Good. I think we're kind of there, Jane. So uh, just give them a few seconds to to uh, stabilize and hopefully appear on Facebook somewhere. Yeah. And I think we can start going ahead. So um, I'm really, really pleased to have uh, the wonderful Jane Arden with me this afternoon to chat to. Um, I've got so much I could talk about, to be honest. I could be here all evening. But um, to give you a bit of background, I, I've known Jane for absolutely ages. She came and did our diploma, um, level four and level five, and we loved her so much um, that we persuaded her to come and teach for us for a while, which was fabulous. Um, Jane went on, she got an honors degree in canine behavior and training. Um, they loved her so much as well that she, she was press ganged into going to teach for them too in their honors, their foundation degree um, courses. Um, so she got recognized teacher status, um, recognized uh, tutor, um, recognized by Ofqual, which, which is great, great accolade here in UK. Um, and while at the same time she was doing all that, she had Wagawaffins, which is basically her, her um, commercial side. So she's really good at running businesses as well, um, which she's built up over the years to this, this fantastic little organization up in Berry. Um, where she's very much hands-on and practical. She's outdoors, she's one of these people that loves the mud, just like her spaniels, which is great. Um, and um, there's not much she doesn't know about dog training, to be honest. Um, and what I like about her work, what I love about Jane's work is that she's, she also brings the kind of academic knowledge, the background of, of behavior science, behavior psychology into that world and applies it in a really practical and, and in many ways a completely unique way, which, which I've never seen bettered. So I'm really pleased to be able to welcome you here, Jane. Thanks very much indeed for taking the time to speak to me. And um, I just want to bring up one kind of um, thing, one thing you say in your CV, and that's, that's you're a hands-on realist. So um, can you explain to us what that means? What is a hands-on realist? So for me, it, it kind of means that like living and breathing, like for me, I always think it's important that anything that I teach and work with, yes. um, I feel that I need to have kind of lived and breathed that experience myself. Hence the um, mud. Hence, yeah, <laughs> hence the mud. So yeah, I think it's really, you know, because what I loved about studying for my degree is you kind of go like, well, in theory, this is this and this is this and then when you go out and you you apply that theory um you know sometimes it doesn't quite um fit the textbook and then yeah. so for me you then have to go back and question more and research more to try and mm. understand why what, what's going on so I kind of enjoy that you know that application because I think it makes you the application makes you learn more theory yes yes exactly and always always questioning what you believe about what you're actually seeing which I think is so critically important. It's a trap that many behaviorists find themselves stuck in, which is they're so they they they're so confident that they understand what's going on um, that they forget just to take a step back sometimes and perhaps reevaluate. And I think that's what you're saying here. It's really a question of definitely. And I think, uh, like for me, I always say to people, you know, if you you know if you hear something. Uh, like I always say, question everything, uh, yeah. you know, absolutely question absolutely everything, especially if it fits within your bias. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because sometimes we'll just accept something because we like the sound of it and it fits in with our beliefs. So, yeah, it, it, exactly. And it works most of the time for us. Yes. regardless of what's going on behind the scenes. Now, I think like most of us who got into the dog world, you came into the behavior side of it. Um, the hard way, really, by starting off with with a, with a fairly difficult dog. And um, I, I remember the story back from when you were with Cope. And what's strange is you ended up with a Leonberger, which is basically a livestock guarding dog, who was behaving far more like a like like, like a spaniel, like a kind of flusher. So so tell tell me tell us about her. Yeah. So um, Dinky was my Leonberger, and um, she was very she had quite she had a pretty strong prey drive she was very visual dog she was very into movement she was into chasing like other dogs so she would do lots of approach and chase but she only did chase play with other dogs right. um, 
and it wasn't like friendly social it was definitely she was performing pre predatory patterns with other mm -hmm. people's dogs and um she was she was a sheep chaser she could smell a sheep from miles away you could see her ass on them um and birds she would chase birds so she would like chase and pounce on my other dogs as mm. well um so she spent a lot of time when she was out when i first got her she was doing a lot of these behaviors with my other dog my polish mm. sheep dog um and at the time i kind of never thought that it was um it was it was a problem you know she was just entertaining herself there was no harm in it because she would just bounce around on top of him when she got there um and obviously now now i know differently <laughs> i wouldn't allow a dog to have performed those behaviors uh, while they're young as she did um and she became very very into the environment and she mm. was very spacey became very obsessed with those behaviors and very very disconnected from me um and I really, really struggled just to get like any engagement from her at all. Um, and especially kind of as, you know, I'd started running dog training classes at the time. And, you know, there was me. I was meant to be a professional trainer. And then I've got this this like 60 kilo dog um, who was like running up to people's shih tzus in the park and going boo because they would run and then she chase them. So I was like, you know, I really need to um, I really need to work on this. And I remember being told at the time that um, another trainer that had seen her run over and chase other dogs. And they said to me, you won't solve this with positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and that probably the only solution was an e-collar. And I remember going away that day and, you know, I, I looked up to that trainer a lot and it really made me question. And I was like, I just can't do this. I can't turn up to my class at the church hall every week going positive training rocks and then put an e-collar on my dog. Um, so what I did was I thought, you know what, I'm just going to try. I'm just going to take what I've learned and I'm just going to go on a journey with this dog and I'm just going to try and see what happens. Um, and the bits of stuff that the bit of stuff that I'd learned about understanding the predatory motor pattern, understanding rewards, um, we went through a process and it was a process that, you know, some days were great. Some days I made huge mistakes, um, but I got the engagement that I needed and I helped her learn how to control those impulses, those sequences. And in the end, I truly believe that, you know, it wasn't down to the toys and the cheese and the sausage and the, the, the like tools that I was using to reinforce that. I honestly think the powerful reinforcer was in the end for her was it was self reinforcing for her to manage her impulses and her instincts. I think that's what was the powerful thing in the end. And she loved it because she got to the point where she loved the fact that she could stop herself. And it was her choice to stop herself and she could yeah. do that. Um, so that was like a huge learning curve. And I, and I always remember thinking back that she didn't, um, she didn't know how to control those impulses. That's, that's why she, she behaved like she did, because she had no capability and obviously no motivation to control those impulses because it was reinforcing for her. Um, and I always think, you know, if I'd have put an e-collar on her, it would have been like electrocuting somebody for walking a tightrope that had never walked, you know, falling off yeah. the tightrope and they'd never walked one before. Um, so for me, yeah, I, I mean, I, gosh, I, I like learned so much from that experience with her. And my ultimate test with, with her was we actually took her on a, because sheep were my like worst, she, she, she chased some cheap sheep when we were on holiday. And I honestly thought she was going to get shot. She'd headed towards the farm. Um, and my ultimate test with her was we, we took her on a sheep herding day um, and I took her to work on the sheep and I was able to have her out with the sheep um, and manage her. And I was able to, she actually did switch into chase at one point while we was working on the sheep and I was able to recall her off them. Um, and the shepherd, the shepherd had come from Italy, I think. And he actually said to me, he worked a lot in Europe with Leonbergers who are sheep chasers. Yes. Um, he said, you have really, really good control of this dog. And he said, 
you know, she doesn't have a herding instinct. He said, she's got a chase drive. He said, but she doesn't have a herding instinct. He said, but you've got enough control that you could probably work her on the sheep. And mm. I just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to have you. I was like, don't, don't, <laughs> don't push, really don't push your luck. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, I have, this is, this is my goal. I've achieved my goal. Um, so yeah, that was a huge learning experience yeah. with her. Um, and I did get a lot of criticism of people because a lot of people were like, oh, well, it's just a Liam Berger. It's not that difficult. They don't really have a high prey drive. Um, you know, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, it was difficult. But we yeah. did it. But I, I think it's interesting because what it does is remind me of the fact that with any dog or any person, in actual fact, um, there is there is a space between when a dog makes a decision to do something or when we make a decision to do something and the time you actually decide to do it to put other things in and in psychology there's this thing called um, stop signal reaction time it's used a lot to measure people's levels of impulsivity and uh, certainly one, one one of the things that happens with people with parkinson's disease is their as you know their, their dopamine their substantia nigra gets all eaten up and they lose all the dopamine supplying the basal ganglia, which are all very much an integral part of, of, of what sits between making a decision to move and actually making your legs move. Something in between there has to do a job and that, that's what the basal ganglia does. And in people with Parkinson's, that system gets eaten up by disease and um, which is why basically they freeze. They want, to, they want to do something, they want to stand up, but they can't. All of all the all the all the the the, 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 you know, the 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 desire to stand is there. The brain sending signals, but nothing actually happens. And basically, the way they're treated is they they're put on dopamine enhancing drugs, L-dopa, which basically adds new dopamine to the system. But what happens is the dopamine is not balanced, and so um, one of the side effects of that is that these people become incredibly impulsive. Um, and they even become compulsive and they start compulsive gambling and all this kind of stuff. So it has really horrible negative side effects. And I think it's really interesting in the case of, of, of this dog and all dogs, in fact, um, particularly dogs that are branded as impulsive springers. And we'll talk about your other springer in a minute, your new one, your new springer, um, Pickles. Um, but what, 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 what people tend to forget is that it's not just a question of being impulsive. There is something in between there that you can intervene with, which I think is exactly what you did with the Leonberger. So there's a time when, when the dog makes a decision. She saw a sheep or whatever it happened to be, or the, or the little um, shih tzu, whatever it happened to be over the side of the park there. She made the decision to go for it. But there is a time between the time that that uh, decision is made, which for her is a kind of go signal, mm -hmm. um, and then the time that you intervene with a stop. And I think what you've done, and th th there's a time where if those two are too far apart, the signal has traveled far enough in the system within the basal ganglia uh, where it's beyond the point of no return. Um, and, and that point is a, is a, is a, is a nucleus called the, the subthalamic nucleus, which is way down below the basal ganglia. So it's, you can imagine the signal flowing all the way through these basal, basal ganglia, these coils in, in the brain there, they get down to the subthalamic nucleus, and from there it goes down into the spinal cord. And when it reaches that point, beyond that, there's a put no that's beyond the point of no return. But what you can do is basically manipulate that little bit of time, the few milliseconds in between. And I think that's what you did with this dog. So it's not a kind of lost hope. You've no. just extended that little bit of time, and she's then intervened with her own stop signal. Which is what you see where she where she looks at the sheep or whatever it is, oh, and she puts her own stop in. Yeah. So I like so so what you've just said then. So um, Victor Frankel, uh, Holocaust survivor. Yes, I know. Said, so he says there's a space between stimulus and response. Exactly. Exactly. Um, That's exactly and, what that is. Yeah, and 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 he talks about if we work within that space, um, you get better within that space where you can stop and like for humans we can stop and think and make and make yes. better decisions rather than exactly. going ahead with horses. Exactly. Um, yeah so again like when I'm training my dog that's what I always think like a lot of the training exercises and the stuff I have in my book it is about working in that space getting them to stop and think and at first they're slow to process it mm -hmm. but then they get better at it and they get yeah. quicker at it. It's like a muscle it needs practice it's not going to work straight away it can take months sometimes 
but there is yeah. a space in there and they're certainly not write off dogs. But the problem is that people, I think if people realize this more, uh, that there is a way of doing it without using aversives like shocks, then more people would use it. But I think people tend to think that it's just this closed box and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. So it's one of those things. What, what, what's Victor Frankl's book called? I, I'm just trying to remember. Um, man's, there's a man's will to mean in. That, that, um, it's the really small one. Anyway, uh, uh, listeners should really go and look that book up if they're not familiar with the work. It's a brilliant yeah. book to read. Very, it very is. insightful. Um, there's, there's also, um, so Stephen Covey and his Seven Habits of Highly Effective yes. People, he yes. talks about that space within one of his habits as well. Yes, yeah. Well worth going and reading that literature, I, I think. Um, now, what about pickles? I know you you went from, from one, one chaser what? to another. <laughs> So I had pickles. Um, so pickles was my first work. She's a working cocker. She's my first yeah. working cocker spaniel. And because I had kind of got so much into dog training with Dinky, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, um, I want like a, a like a like a proper dog to train, um, something that's easily motivated. <laughs> got some bump about it. <laughs> I eventually accepted my Leonberger breed limitations um, and decided to get this little working cocker spaniel. And I decided that because she, um, because I was working with a lot of show cockers with aggression, I definitely mm. didn't want a show cocker. So I went out and bought one with a big red pedigree full of field trial champions <laughs> to make sure there was no show cocker in there and ended yeah. up with like little Ferrari. And I mean, she was a great dog to train. I loved training her. She was so busy. She was so active. I just did loads of stuff with her. It was a very different experience mm. to my little burger. Mm everything was 3000 miles an hour <laughs> um, and I ended up she was a great little dog I had 100% recall with her mm. she was like fantastic um, and then I introduced her to game um, I took her on a training day and introduced her to game and I came home with a very different dog um, I had certainly like it literally like she'd gone up about 17 gears um, that day she became obsessed with chasing um she actually ran through an electric fence wet after diving through mm. a river Blimey. ran through the electric fence wet picked a bird up and came back through the <laughs> fence and back into the river like absolutely just did not care she was um she was hard as nails um and she was very full on and very intense um and i came away with then with a dog who was so obsessed with the environment and that was one day like one experience yeah, yeah. He was just like extreme. So one um, trial learning isn't just about aversives. It's about the things you love in life too. Reinforcement. Yeah. Um, and I remember taking her back to my local park and the dog wouldn't even look at me. She was just on the end of the lead, just like scanning the environment and just like, let me go, let me go. And she would be intense. Her frustration would go mm. through the roof. She would scream at me. Um, and she was obsessed with chasing as well. Um, and what was really interesting with her was like, um, I went back to basics and did a lot of work with her. Um, but she, like, I could, um, I could like go on a, you know, to a kind of do a demonstration at some mm -hmm. local event where I'm dummies and she was steady as a rock, but get her on, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> get the wildlife in there with a heartbeat. <laughs> and um, she was a very different dog. Um, I think I remember the first time we I tried the bolting rabbit, the which is rabbit fur on a bungee cord. Yes. Um, and I remember she was just on the end of her lead screaming because she couldn't get to it. I really struggled to manage her arousal and frustration. Um, and I was told by a lot of gun, gun dog people, a lot of people like, oh, you would just sell a dog like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. just we, we, we end up with them in spring rescue. Yeah, yeah, they were just like, oh, you just, you can't fix that, you, you know, um, just, just, just sell it. And I remember again, I was like, I was like, oh, there must be something I'm doing here with these dogs. There's a bit of a pattern developing. I've got <laughs> Jason Leonberger and now I've got this uh, kind of rabbit murdering uh, cocker. And she was fast. She would catch stuff. She caught and killed rabbits. Um, she actually caught and retrieved, thankfully didn't kill. She caught and retrieved my friend's cockerel. She was just like, yeah, she was, she was pretty wild. 
And again, what I did was I would, you know, I was hoping to do some competition with her. And I thought, you know what, I need to, I need to put that, that plan that I had with this dog, I need to put that to one side somewhere else and look at what I've got in front of me right now, because otherwise I'm going to find this is going to be frustrating and disappointing for me. And that's what I love about you, Jane, the way you recognize that not things aren't going quite so well and you stop and you reevaluate so important yeah. and and I just said I said do you know what I'm going to I'm going to work with this dog we're going to work through this mm. stuff um and I'm just going to see where where we go what can we achieve what can happen so we didn't have a goal I just said do you know what I'm just going to use it as a learning experience I'm a mm. professional dog trainer and I think this dog's going to going to teach me a lot and I actually ended up going and working with a traditional trainer and we'd had a conversation and I said, I need somebody who knows these dogs um, to help me with her, um, but I'm not going to get hold of her <laughs> and I'm not going to beat her. Can you help me? Um, and we got together and we had like, you know, we had great discussions. And I remember one day um, this trainer had homing pigeons, so we were able to work. And we did stuff like set her up for success. We worked in his mm. courtyard where she couldn't escape and, and he flushed the pigeons out of his game bag. If she chased, she never got anywhere. The pigeons just flew back home. Um, and we were able to, um, to kind of, to, to steady her up. And then we moved on to working her outside. Um, and yeah, I mean, that those, like the repetitions and the reevaluation and everything we had to do with her, and we worked together and like, you know, the trainer would say, oh, I would do it like this. And then I would say, right, well, if we're doing it from a positive reinforcement point of view, let's try it like this. That's, that's how I would do that setup differently. Um, and I remember one day, you know, he because he said to me, I think he'd gone through a box of pigeons who'd all flew back to their <laughs> house and we had to go and he's like, I need to go and get some more pigeons. And he said to me, he said, I just want to get hold of her. And I went, you know, I know how you feel. Like I said, we're, we're still the same. We still, you know, um, get annoyed and frustrated. I said, but what I'm not going to do is get hold of her. I'm going to continue to problem solve instead, instead of just allowing my frustration. Um, to take over this this learning process um, so yeah we worked really well and what we actually did with her was she was obsessed with the chase and she would she would have to flush and we actually took the retrieving aspect right out of everything that we did with her um, and what we actually did was we got her um, into um, going back down onto the scent so instead of um, like a hunt a flush and, and a chase which was what mm. she was doing instead of going in for what you would traditionally do is just stop the dog um, is um, what we actually did was we got her down onto the fresh scent so we redirected and we created a new pattern mm -hmm. so it was hunt flush and yes at they carry on hunting just got some dogs barking people lurking outside oh. um, <laughs> um so yeah we would so what we did was we created a new pattern with her which mm. was it was hunt flush and hunt on um and then she would find some more stuff to flush and she would go you know the the the, the reinforcement from the actual hunting which with most spaniels normally um, is their like highest value yeah. highest value thing and I ended up um I but where, what I achieved with her was that she ended up a beating dog she worked three four seasons as a beating dog um and even with her you know I always said to people I was pipping my whistle while we were working but she was just doing a job I don't ever think she was actually listening <laughs> <laughs> Um, but she'd learned a new pattern and I could hunt her close. I could, you know, um, keep her with me. I could get her to work. She would flush the game. She would watch it away. She would go back down and she would she would continue to hunt. Um, so, yeah, that took a lot of work um, and learning to manage her arousal and frustration. You know, I had to take it, it was all about emotion. It was all about the, the, every single decision I made in her training was about her emotional state. 
yeah but the nice thing is you're not taking anything away what you're doing is redirecting it just to, to, to a different level of something that is still very rewarding for her yeah that yeah. that's the big difference it's so easy to dive in with any kind of punishment however mild that might be you know just picking the dog up and giving it a shake right the way yeah. through to using shock collars and the fact is what you get at the end of it is a, is, is a happy healthy dog and also an owner if it's somebody you're working with which doesn't isn't left sort of feeling guilty about it yeah. um yeah. i mean the number of rescues we get in that, that that are broken dogs who have been punished and you it takes months and months and months just to rehabilitate them to, to get them into a suitable state to be rehomed again and yet they still remain frightened but um yeah it's it, it's a great story and I, and I think um we'll talk a little bit about compulsive dogs later on when we, when we look at habits but mm -hmm. I think at this point, it's quite nice just to, we've talked about um, impulsive like behavior. And um, I don't think spaniels are particularly impulsive. I think the reason spaniels are as they are is because you'll never find them being used as guide dogs. As Labradors, lab, lab, you know, Labradors are in a coma compared to spaniels, just a normal daily life. So it's that, it's just that kind of contrast of breed type. Um, but I think, I think, just just to sort of ground it in 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 um, a bit of science, I think the idea of impulsivity or impulsiveness is basically is basically not being able to stop doing things that make you feel good, um, and that compares with compulsiveness, which, as far as psychology is concerned, it's basically um, it's you, you do it because it actually stops making you feel bad. So it's completely the opposite. It's a kind of negative. You're avoiding negative reinforcements. But we'll talk about that in the context of habits. In a little while. Um, so there's one other thing I want to pass by you, Jane. You might recall that um, when you passed through us at COPE, one of the things I presented at level five was this idea of um, the importance of energy reserves in terms of mental effort in dogs. And there was this really nice study <clears throat> that I showed you by um, Holly Miller. University of Kentucky, <clears throat> excuse me, at that time. <clears throat> and what she did is she set up a really nice experiment where she had dogs in a crate and she had dogs doing a sit stay. And what she did is she compared a dog doing a sit stay for 10 minutes um, with a dog that was just put into a shut crate where they just uh, relaxed and, and settled down for 10 minutes. And then after that period of time, she took them out and she gave them a toy with a treat in it. But uh, the toy was designed in such a way that they couldn't actually get the treat out. And what she found is that um, the dogs that had actually had to do the sit stay for 10 minutes gave up using uh, trying to get the treat out of the toy much sooner than the dogs that had, uh, had a chance to sit, um, lie down in the crate and do nothing. And so her conclusion basically was that, they, that, that just the very fact of sitting and doing nothing had depleted their energy reserves in the brain and they just didn't have enough left to be persistent at doing the toy. And she, she proved that hypothesis by basically giving the dogs, both dogs, uh, shots of glucose before they either did the sit stay or stayed in the crate. And uh, what she found when, they, when the dogs had glucose is that the dogs that had to do the sit stay and depleted their energy reserves um, basically spent more time, the same time as the dogs had been in the crate. But when she gave them sucralose, which is a, um, a sugar without any calories in it, um, the dogs that had to do the sit stay again failed. And I think this brings up a really important thing, which, which, which I'd like your views on, um, of the idea of when you have a dog that is going through a lot of mental effort, not necessarily running around like your pickles, um, but dogs that are having to do sit stay and, and obedience type stuff. What are your views on, on perhaps topping up the calories or being mindful about um, the cognitive effort um, that they're actually having to put in, which of course is completely invisible to the trainer or the owner. The dog's just doing something like sitting or um, doing some obedience um, uh, maneuver, um, mm -hmm. which appears to the owner to be fairly energy um, efficient or, or doesn't use much energy. So what, what are your views about that? Does, have you come across anything like that in your kind of career? So I think for me, um, I suppose one of the things that um, it relates to is when we talk about um, like using food in training. And again, what some people will do is get their dogs to kind of work for all their food. Yeah. yeah. Um, and or what people do is might make these dogs hungry. Yes. Um, 
so then they're food motivated mm. Um, and the way that I always look at training is I think I always think homeostasis first yes. and I think when we train dogs they need to be not yes they need to be motivated by food but they need to be not hungry because that's going to impact their ability to concentrate and learn um, and also kind of like how we use food so I know like with um, with the working dogs because they're using a lot of energy up especially in the field and um, so so feeding them high energy food throughout the day as well um, while those dogs while those dogs are working and actually not making them work for all that food either while they're training as such is you know my dogs will when we're out on a shoot day they'll get they'll get handfuls of stuff yeah. um, and they get and and they'll get a high energy lunch as well so again you know making making sure that you're meeting those needs it's surprising how many working dogs um are you here through the season of working dogs who've collapsed and working mm. dogs who've collapsed and started to uh, convulsions as well yeah. hyperglycemia um, because these dogs just don't they just don't know when to stop yeah. Um, so yeah for me it's very much it, it's about recognizing that you know when they're doing that that brain work as such is mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 expensive isn't it it is very and, yeah and it, yeah. what i find with the spaniels one of the things i notice with them is sometimes when when you're working with them is what you get and i always say because they don't stop with their busyness is i always say you can get to a point where the it's like the brain switched off but the body hasn't yes. Exactly. Well, well, basically, it's because you're 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 short of glucose in the brain. Yeah. Uh, and bearing in mind that the brain is about a, a two percent of body weight, yet it uses about twenty percent of all the energy you consume, and it's roughly the same for dogs. So, and I think I think it's an important point because I think it's a lot of uh, it's something that a lot of professional trainers and and behaviorists and people who compete with dogs kind of tend to forget that it's not just it's not just the behavior it's, it's the cognitive effort the emotional side of the animal that well that really matters and i think yeah. one one point um that's probably worth thinking about with working dogs i like pickles that's running around a lot and it's so excited uh which is different from the the, the kind of sitting and doing obedience classes where the, the level of excitement is very low is thinking about the levels of cortisol in the blood and I think it's worth pointing out that cortisol, cortisol is not stress hormone. The reason cortisol is there is, as you say, to help maintain homeostasis. It's a way of releasing lots of glucose really, really quickly when the body thinks it's going to need it to keep that homeostatic balance, which, of course, is, is involved in stress. If you're frightened or stressed, yes, cortisol is released. But it's also released um, when a dog is excited. You and I are now releasing cortisol. Um, and it's going up and down all over the place because our, our, our arousal levels are differing, our cognitive arousal levels. And so are the people's cortisol who are watching this, 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 uh, this chat. Um, so, again, I think it's one of those things that, that's kind of neglected and perhaps ought to be talked to more about in, 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 the, in the sort of dog training circles. Um, right. OK. Uh, another case which I want to talk to you about is this, is this Doberman. Mm -hmm. that you've been to see another another behaviorist tell, tell, tell us about him yeah so um so penny is a doberman i think she's coming up to two and mm -hmm. um, i was actually um the dog was referred to me from a friend who does t touch mm -hmm. because they were looking for some um practical support with this dog they were looking for some practical help with this dog's reactivity um, so what I said to them was um, because they'd already had they'd, they'd done quite a lot of work with this dog. So I said to them, you know, send me your behavior reports and everything else. I'll have a look through them um, and we'll come down and we'll look at we'll look at getting some practical sessions together. Um, so Penny came, we started off. We did. We just did a block booking of four one to ones. Um, and I remember when Penny came into the room um, she was not confident. Mm. She was um she was quite she was a bit wary of me she was wary of the environment and we allowed her to um kind of just have a little investigation around the room um and explore and what what so kind of from my observations were um as she was able to explore the environment her stress levels went down she felt more comfortable that she'd explored this environment but for me, there was very little connection between 
um, Penny and 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 her owners. So you know, if they got food out, she would do stuff. But the, for me, there was like no connection. So one of the things we talked about was. Um, I, so I said to them, I said, you know, what you've been advised to do. She does seek confidence out of the environment. But what I would um, what I would say is that if you know, I said if she was my dog, I would want her to um i would want her to gain that confidence from me and being with me yeah. from a relationship point of view rather than her going i can't deal with you right now mm -hmm. i need the environment to support me and interestingly i think we see a lot of that in dogs where dogs yes. will disengage from their owners when yeah. life's too much pressure because the environment provides makes them feel better about themselves mm -hmm. so it rebalances those emotions the environment's um, also stable, which not the owner isn't necessarily so. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, we, um, so one of the things we talked about was I said, you know, let's look at some engagement. And then they said to me, they'd been advised to stop all training with her. So what, what Penny would do was Penny would go outside, even if it was like stepping out of her front door mm. um, and any change in the environment. So like a car coming past, a person a dog anything that ch a changed in the environment she would lose the plot um, and she would redirect onto them and bite them um with like complete over arousal frustration so um and she was biting them a lot she was biting them at home as well there was a lot of frustration going on at home as well and she was biting them there and you know when they when they came they were nervous around her you could see they were they were yeah. scared of of, of of pushing her too far with whatever they were doing and 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 her biting and even you know I looked and I was like yeah if I push my look this dog's gonna bite me you you know you could see that um in her but she was also once she got once she felt comfortable with you she was she was quite pushy as well and typical kind of manipulative female dog that <laughs> manipulation you see in the in the in the girls more than the yes, boys yes. and and she was a typical Doberman clown as well when she was comfortable, which was lovely. And so, so we had a conversation and, and they said that they'd been advised to stop all training with her because, um, because of her frustration and, and obviously how she responds to the frustration. So I said to them, I said, I do understand that. I said, but I don't think that training should be frustrating. Like, like training shouldn't be frustrating. So I said, you know, she's a Doberman, she's a working dog, she's bred, she's literally bred to work with a person. That's like, that's, that's, that's what she's been bred for centuries about, is it this, this going out and working with a person and doing the obedience and, and mm. everything else. That's what Dobermans are. Um, and her owners were lovely, you know, they'd had like three, four Dobermans before, they'd competed in agility, they were experienced dog people, and they'd never um, had a dog, had a dog like Penny. And um, so what we did with her, so the first thing, and I do this with a lot of my clients anyway, but what I said was I said, just get up onto the floor with her. You've got the food. She knows the food's on offer. Um, and I want you to wait and see what she offers you. Is she ready to work with you? So, so don't, don't get on her back, get the food out and start asking her to do stuff. What I want you to do is, is let her know that that reinforcement is available from you. Um, but what I want you to do is wait and see if if she's ready to work. So I said, if she offers you some behavior, you know, reward it. Um, and we did and just simple things like, you know, like training is pressure to a lot of dogs. And even like taking a treat out of an owner's hand is pressure to some dogs that are struggling. So I said, you know, don't feed her from your hand. I want you to drop the food from the floor because I think taking food out of your hand is pressure for her. She feels that that then she's got to start doing stuff. So I fed on the floor, fed her to the floor. Um, she did a few reps of offering. I think it was a sit and I think she threw in a down once she was getting quite comfortable. So then I said, now I want you to ask her to do something. So what he did was he asked her for a simple sit and um, she took the food and she disengaged. And I said, OK that cue is pressure. And I always say to people like, engagement isn't about the dog doing a behavior for you and getting a reward. Engagement for me is about what does the dog choose to do after it's earned the reward? Does it stay with you? 
or does it go now nah, doing something else and go back to the environment so this was one of the things we talked about and I said I don't want you to ask anything from her until she, you and, and you know do training with her until you've asked her to do something um, and she re-engages straight away then you know she's ready so she can now have a conversation with you about where she's at in the environment can can she work in this environment can she not work in this environment um so that was so that was like their first week homework was mm -hmm. was to go away and work on that um and they came back and you you could even see just just from that first session there was a difference in the relationship um and certainly her owners were starting to enjoy her again and she was enjoying them she was like yeah what were we doing come on let's do some stuff um and a lot of what we did then was really working through that, just that communication um, and understanding and recognizing. Um, and what I did really love was the tea touch that they'd done prior to me. Um, if we did ever see her like revving up a little bit, the tea touch was absolutely fabulous. For, and she loved her tea touch. Mm. Um, and she would quite happily go like, oh yeah, do some tea touch and help me out here. Um, so that was really nice as well. The tea touch played a big part in that. Um, but what was interesting was because I was like, um, we got to the point where um, they were able to go out of the house. Um, they were able to, we could work with different distractions. Um, the first time I tried to bring a dog in the training center, it was not happening. Um, it was just way too much. And, she, you know, she is definitely one of the hardest dogs I've worked mm. with. Um, she was not an easy dog. She was definitely on the kind of extreme scale. Yes. Um, and what we did was we just we just worked on um, doing that, getting that connection, getting that relationship. I said, I don't want you to go to any old places. So what they started to do was, was go to um, supermarket car park, park up at the other end, get her out, get her used to seeing the environment. If it got too much, she could get back into the car. Um, and just creating new habits, new habits of her going somewhere, getting out of the car and doing this. Are you ready? Can you cope with the environment? Can, can you do can you do stuff with me? Um, and then we started to just they started to take her to different places. We started to increase the distractions and level ex, level of exposure for her. Um, and I mean, she's Penny still got she's she's still got work to do. Um, but, you know, they've sent me, um, they've been on holiday with her. He can now walk her down the street. Um, and even when I come back and see him, I just love the relationship. So I remember the first few sessions, once she decided she liked me, um, when they came in, she was very into me and not into them. And now she comes in and she's like, yeah, hi, Jane. And she's like with her owners, like, we, you know, we're doing this is what this is what we've been learning this week. Look, look at what we can do now. Um, and for me, like I love seeing the relationship. Um, and she is still, she's still manipulative, you know, and we still have to like not let her kind of push because she will push and see what she she can uh, see how she can manipulate the situation to her to her own her own uh, agenda as such. Um, and yeah it's just lovely you know and she what's interesting is um she stopped biting them at home um they you know she used to get on the sofa and they'd be like terrified as she fell asleep because mm -hmm. she would sleep startle the sleep startle's gone she doesn't sleep startle anymore um and yeah so yeah um doing really well with her they've been to um she they sent me some pictures of her on the beach they've been to Landudno. so and they said to me at the start, I said, what do you want from me? And they said, we want to be able to take our dog for a walk. Yeah, I want the relationship back. And I think what, what I love about this case, Jane, is it's a, it's a perfect example of what Andrew Hale has been talking about with his task-orientated versus care-orientated approach, where um, owners basically feel they have to do all this stuff. Um, and even the behaviourists that saw it before you, saw Penny before you did, um, recognize there was a problem with the training, with the frustration, um, yet the advice was simply to stop training rather than actually change your attitude to how you do the training, which yes. is exactly what Andy's saying. It needs to be much more orientated towards the dog. And the, the other thing that interests me about this is, is that um, originally this dog was put on fluoxetine as well in an attempt yes. to try and 
control the frustration and the biting. Yes. So, and yeah, they did say to me that the dog, uh, they, they had tried fluoxetine and they said her aggression got really worse. So she actually started resource guarding in the house, which she had done previously as well. Yeah, and that, that's, that's actually classic. And to be honest with you, it is, it is perfectly explainable in relation to how fluoxetine actually works. And I think people think, well, what, what it is, it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. You give that, and what it does is just increase the serotonin, and this serotonin magically just makes a dog feel better. Um, but the fact is, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and one of the things fluoxetine does and the reason it made this dog aggression, I become aggressive, I think, is because um, a, a serotonin is basically an important modulator of the other neuromodulators in the system, particularly dopamine and, and noradrenaline. And there are lots and lots of um, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline neurons that go up into the cerebral cortex, and they, they intertwine with each other and they modulate um, what the what the prefrontal cortex is doing, the bit we were talking about, the bit which is used for self-control and thinking and decision making and all that kind of stuff. It's the kind of business of, 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 of the cognitive and emotional life of an animal. Um, and what, what serotonin's job is, is, is to actually modulate to some high degree these other neuromodulators. Um, and what it, it, what it does, it does this indirectly through uh, GABA um, inhibitory neurons, which are sitting between the serotonin receptors and the dopamine and the nor uh, noradrenaline neurons. Um, and so uh, what, what the serotonin does is the neurons release serotonin into the system. This serotonin binds to a receptor called 5-THC sitting on the GABA neuron. GABA neurons are inhibitory, so this, this GABA neuron is fired up and so it inhibits whatever it's attached to. And a lot of these GABA neurons are attached to dopamine and noradrenaline neurons in the brain. Now, this is great because if you're really depressed and um, the hallmark of depression is that you have no motivation, you don't want to do anything, you don't enjoy things in life, so you tend to withdraw. What we see with dogs is they sleep in their baskets all day, they don't want to go out. Um, chronic the depression is a, is, a, is a feature of chronic anxiety. So dogs that are always anxious um, become depressed. Fluoxetine works really, really well on those dogs because it immediately um, blocks the serotonin, uh, the, this, this serotonin interfering with the dopamine and uh, noradrenaline release. Because what serotonin does is it binds to these 5-HT2C receptors on, sitting on the, on the GABA neurons and it blocks them. And so it takes this block off. So, they, so these animals suddenly get all this noradrenaline and serotonin. With your Doberman, Doberman it, it has exactly the opposite effect because by blocking these 5-HT2 receptors, that increases the amount of noradrenaline and dopamine flowing into this, into this dog's brain, into its decision-making processes. And it's a bit like taking too much speed. Anyone who's taken too much amphetamine, too much speed becomes really agitated. They become anxious, they become frustrated. Um, and that really then triggers aggression and all this sort of thing. So I think it's completely explainable why that dog became aggressive on fluoxetine. So fluoxetine is great for some things, but not everything. So it's one of those things I think that people should watch out for when using these, these pharmacological interventions. So fabulous case that, I think. Yeah, it's fab. I've really enjoyed it. Loved it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, I think we've got some 10 minutes or so left. Yeah. And um, because I'm in spring rescue and because we take on a lot of older dogs that have that got really into bad habits and that kind of stuff, they're really ingrained in their behaviours, uh, chasing and, and um, running off and doing their own thing, becoming self-employed dogs, I think you call them. Um, tell me a little bit about that, the kind of dogs you deal with and, and what your feelings and thinking is on those kind of dogs that you get in. So we've got, um, like, I see a lot of spaniels who have, you know, they've, they've gone out to the park and, you know, what a lot of owners do, I think, is the mindset is if the dog's on lead, it has to do obedience and then they let it off and it's the dog's free time. And these dogs then go and just, you know, they're, they're, they're hunting and searching, they're getting their dopamine rush, they're enjoying, mm -hmm. um, you know, interacting and engaging with the environment yes. and they become like, <laughs> obsessed with it and um, because you know that for me it's like it's part of their genetics it's it's what they're all about 
Um, and then what happens is then it starts to create problems where the dog starts to range further or the dog finds something and chases it. Um, the dog stops listening to the owner. Um, and then they kind of come and want those problems that have developed to be fixed. And actually the dog spent all this time rehearsing and, and creating these, these, these habits um, of having no engagement with their yeah. owner. I think that they're kind of definitely the, the harder dogs to work with, especially those drivey, like field bred spaniels. Exactly. And I think just for the benefit of the audience, the, these dogs are completely different to, to manage than the dogs we've been talking about, which are the young kind of high drive dogs and the Dobermans. These are dogs where this behavior is really rooted in for years sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I had, um, it, was, it wasn't a Spaniel, but it was actually a GSP, mm. that uh, German short haired pointer, um, that was a rescue from abroad. And when this dog came to me, um, it was um, sheep chasing, it had chased and killed uh, llamas. Um, and it had come to, when it came to me, the lady had it on an e-collar and she came to me because she said she did, she wasn't comfortable with the dog being on an e-collar and she would like to look at some other solutions. Um, and this dog was very independent when it was out. It was very into the environment, very independent, um, beautiful dog. And one of the things we talked about was, was this dog's history, um, it had been astray, it looked after itself, mm. the environment had provided it with life. Um, and so it was a very environmentally interested dog. It had come into the UK and also learned that it could um, provide itself with food and everything else from our environment too. So one of the things we spoke about was, and this is something I always look at with these dogs, is I'll say, well, you know, what somebody would, might cause a call a problem or a distraction now go that's probably where our reinforcement is that we need yes. to understand this yeah. like what is the dog choosing to do because because it obviously makes the dog feel good so one of the things she said that the dog would do was it was really good it would always find eggs it would find nests in the ground yeah. and I said well it probably <laughs> survived through those um, so one of the things is that's what we tapped into. So I said, I want you to nip to the supermarket and get some eggs and we're going to start hiding some eggs and doing some searches where um, you're going to guide the dog onto the, you're going to help the dog guide the dog onto the good stuff. So really, rather than kind of compete against those, those reinforcers the dog had already experienced, I got the owner involved in it. Mm. And got the dog to believe that we got the dog to believe that the owner was as good a hunter as the dog was. <laughs> um, and I remember that she'd posted on a group that her, her engagement had gone up 80% by literally just hiding eggs. That's amazing. And, um, and, and searching because the dog was like, this is the best thing ever. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think you call these dogs reinforcing the naughtiness, or at least what you do where the, the traditional idea is you, you basically need to redirect them to be doing something else. What you do is you actually engage them in doing what they're doing, but in a controlled way. So you're actually reinforcing what they're being, uh, what the owner wants to stop them doing in the first place. Yeah, and it, it's, you know, I always say like, you know, with these dogs, if you, if, if you, like when we train dogs with positive reinforcement, they always have a choice. They always have a, a, an opt out. They can always say, no, I don't want to do that. No, that's too much. And I like that they can do that because I think that enables a conversation between the owner and the yes. dog, that the dog's able to speak back. So the way that I kind of look at it is if these dogs are, um, if what we need to do is to enable those conversations or the dog to want to have those conversations with mm -hmm. us, we need to get involved in what they're doing first. Exactly. Um, and then we can start to build on, you know, I always say, let's, let's meet the dog's needs and then you'll achieve your goals. And basically it's things like that with this particular dog is probably the cause of the egg shortage. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> But I think that there's, there's an interesting kind of neuro point on this as well. Uh, and, and the reason I, I brought the point up that these dogs are not the same as the, the, uh, the younger dogs we're talking about, the Brackens in this world and, and, um, uh, and, and Joel Leonberger, um, simply because uh, when we're dealing with these really ingrained behaviours, it really is a habit. And habits are something very specific. Uh, habits really are more of a compulsion. And uh, what, what I said earlier is that in, the impulsivity 
is doing something because it makes you feel good. Compulsivity is just the opposite. You're doing it because it makes you feel bad if you don't. So um, and that, that's what a habit is. And basically, a habit is something which is, which is incredibly adaptive because what it does is it helps the brain take shortcuts, um, i.e. save energy. So it comes back to your idea of homeostasis and the importance of homeostasis and balancing energy. Um, it's pointless to, to have a brain that doesn't farm off things that you're doing commonly, a bit like us driving, um, into a habit where, where it's done automatically. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's again, it's using these circuits that sit the basal ganglia, these circuits that sit between the decision making parts of the brain and the, and the motor parts of the brain, and then the output to the, the behavior, the legs and everything else. Um, but, the, but, but what happens with a habit is it's actually shifted from the reinforcing side of that circuit, the ventral striatum part, up into the dorsal striatum, which is basically the, the kind of mindless, just do it, not thinking about it too much. And that's why it becomes so hard ingrained. And I think what you've done with the eggs is basically um, you've managed to bring that circuit back from this, this dorsal placement in the basal ganglia back in part to the ventral placement. So, it's, so it, it, it starts, the dogs then starts to use that circuit in the same way that the, the circuits were being used in the younger dogs, like Bracken. And so they're actually getting the reinforcement back. So you're pulling the habit back in and turning it back into something which the dog is working for to have reinforced, which I, th which I think is a really important thing because what it does is, 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 is show that if you, if you tackle these kind of problems in a, in a rather unique and novel way, like you've done, what you can do is actually bring them back from, from something you're simply trying to stop doing and redirecting it um, to something that, that the owner can engage with as well. Okay, that's cool. So um, I think we're going to be about on time, actually. Wow. <laughs> I, don't know, I know, kind of where it's gone. Yeah, yeah. So is there anything else you want to tell us about in, in the last few minutes? No, I don't think so. Everything, I think. Yeah, I think we've, we've covered quite a lot there, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Certainly lots of food for thought. Yeah. Well, yeah. fantastic. Thanks ever so much for taking the time to talk to me, Jane. That was, that was fabulous. And perhaps Thanks. we can do it again sometime. Tell us yeah, some more about some of your other cases. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks very much, the Dog Centre Care, for letting me host this on your platform. That's That's been really great fun. Um, and I'm speaking to Lorna next week sometime. I think it's the 4th of May or something like that at 7 o'clock in the evening. I have to look it up. I can't remember the time. But thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, enjoy your tea. Enjoy your supper. And uh, hope to see you again. Ah. Uh.